911, add us to the emergency. Yes. Um, uh, my son just called me, and uh, he told me he... Oh, my God. You know, Carolina, uh, he killed his, his baby. Some flowers in front of the scene were police here in Nightdale were first called on Earlston Court around 9 a.m. for a welfare check. When they got here, they discovered the body of seven-month-old Bennett Plato. Now, a developing story this noon hour, a case of incest, murder, and suicide leaves two people dead here in Connecticut and three different states now investigating. In breaking news this evening, a multi-state investigation along the East Coast that ended tragically in Connecticut. Yeah, it all started in North Carolina with an alleged incestual relationship between a father and a daughter. Today, we're examining a complex saga of domestic abuse, manipulation, incest, and murder. It reveals colossal failures at multiple turns to protect vulnerable victims from a predator in their midst. This tangled story spans decades, beginning in Levittown, New York in 1995. 20-year-old Stephen Plato was known as a bullied, isolated young man prone to concerning anger issues. He often lost jobs for his volatile temper. Seeking connection, Stephen turned to the early internet, interacting in chat rooms. There, he met a 15-year-old girl named Alyssa from Texas. Despite the stark age gap and distance, they built an intimate relationship online. Desperate to meet his underage online girlfriend, Stephen took a long bus trip to Texas. Just as he'd hoped, they quickly hit it off. Smitten, Alyssa ran away from home to be with Stephen. At just 16, she became pregnant, but Stephen's inner demons emerged rapidly. Unemployed, he relied on Alyssa financially. Worse, he physically and emotionally abused the vulnerable teen. When their baby girl, Denise, was born, Alyssa made a chilling discovery bruises all over her body. When confronted, Stephen admitted to brutally pinching the newborn to silence her cries. To protect her child, 16-year-old Alyssa faced the excruciating choice to put Denise up for adoption at eight months old. Denise was adopted by Tony and Kelly Fusco, a couple in Dover, New York. They renamed her Katie, and finally, she was safe from harm. But back in Texas, Alyssa stayed with abusive Stephen. Over the next 20 years, his manipulation and threats continued, keeping her trapped. Somehow, they had two more children together in 2007 and 2012, but the damage was done. Alyssa was isolated, dominated by Stephen's coercion and volatility. His threats kept her afraid to leave. Meanwhile, Katie flourished with her adoptive parents. She developed into a bright, talented teen full of creativity. Katie graduated high school in 2016, excited for college. But she couldn't silence one question. Who were her biological parents? Now 18, Katie used social media to contact Alyssa and Stephen in Texas. They immediately bonded over messages. Drawn to her roots, Katie chose to move there, forgoing college plans. At first, Stephen seemed overjoyed, dramatically changing his appearance to impress his newly discovered daughter but warning signs quickly appeared. He defiantly slept in Katie's room, refusing to leave when confronted. In November, after over 20 years of turmoil, Alyssa finally separated from Stephen. But Katie stayed behind, increasingly under his sway. With Alyssa gone, Stephen's twisted desires emerged. He fell in love with his own daughter. Just months after divorcing Alyssa, Stephen married 18-year-old Katie in his backyard, surrounded by family. Katie soon became pregnant with Stephen's child, a living result of their incest. But in January 2018, Stephen and Katie were arrested for incest after Alyssa uncovered their relationship. Though released on bail and ordered not to contact each other, immense damage was already done. Katie gave birth to Stephen's son, Bennett. As Katie came to her senses, she broke it off with Stephen for good. Unable to accept losing his daughter and lover, Stephen unraveled. On April 11, 2018, he picked up baby Bennett and drove 500 miles to confront Katie in New York. The next day, while following Katie and her adoptive dad, Tony, Stephen committed the unthinkable. At a busy intersection, he pulled up and fired a rifle multiple times, killing them both. Witnesses identified the shooter as Stephen. He was found dead hours later from a self-inflicted gunshot after a short manhunt. 
Chillingly, he had also smothered baby Bennett first. Excuse me, 911, add us to the emergency. Yes, um, uh, my son just called me and uh, he told me he, oh my God. In North Carolina, uh, he killed his, his baby and he's in the house. Okay, you said that he told you he killed his baby. <laughs> Okay, ma'am, listen to me. What's your name? Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Uh, he, he's, I, I, he's, he's not home. His wife broke up with him over the phone yesterday. And he told me, she's in New York, and he told me he was on his way. He called me last night and said he's on his way. He's going to bring the baby to her and then he was coming back and he just, he just okay. he said he doesn't have he killed his wife he killed her father and he I can't even believe this is happening okay. and did this happen in Nightdale uh, no the, the, the his wife and father are in New York Okay, and, so the but, incident but actually... he left. He left the baby dead when he left. Okay, he where did with. where did he leave the baby? Okay, he said it was in the. <laughs> What's your son's name? <gasps> What's his last name? Same as mine. When did uh, this happen? He said. He left last night. He called me, I forget, maybe about seven last night and said he was on his way to New York. He was going to bring to his wife and give it to her. And then he'd be back. And and he called me this morning. I, I just got up the phone just a couple of minutes ago. And he told and I. Oh, God. He told me to call the police that I shouldn't go over there. Okay, so the son is, uh, so your son is not there? No, no, the house is empty. The, oh, he said he put a key under the front mat. To take a key to get into the house under the front mat. Did he say how oh, he my. did it? Or what no, he did? No, and I, I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him. I didn't want to know. Oh, my God. Such a wonderful little boy. Okay, hold, hold, hold on just a second, okay? <laughs> okay. Hello? Okay, I'm still here. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get you over to Raleigh Communications, okay? Let me talk first when I call, okay? So I can kind of give them an idea of what was going on, and then I'm going to let you speak with a telecommunicator, okay? Nice. All right, hold on for me, okay? A developing story this noon hour, a case of incest, murder, and suicide leaves two people dead here in Connecticut and three different states now investigating. News 8's Ken Pierce live in News 8 Control this midday with the very latest from police in New Milford. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon to you, Keith, and police now say that that 20-year-old Katie Pladel and 56-year-old Anthony Fusco were killed in his pickup truck in New Milford yesterday by multiple gunshots from an assault rifle. Police say pulling that trigger was Stephen Pladel, who was Katie's father, husband, and father of her baby. The story behind the gunfire near the New York-Connecticut border was all summed up in a heartbreaking 911 call in North Carolina. Uh, he killed his his baby. That's the mother of Stephen Pladel. She technically had custody of seven-month-old Bennett Pladel, but her son Stephen had him Wednesday, and that's when he got a phone call. His wife broke up with him over the phone yesterday. By wife, she means 20-year-old Katie Pladel, who was also Stephen's daughter. She was adopted at birth by the Fusco family in Wingdale, New York. At 18, she wanted to find her birth parents. She did, even moving in with them and eventually sleeping with and marrying her biological father. Her mother moved out and called police. You may recall that those individuals were the subject of an arrest here in Nightdale back in January 2018. Courts there ordered her to move back in with her adoptive parents in New York. Police say she was running errands with her adoptive father, Anthony Fusco, yesterday. Stephen Platel drove hundreds of miles after killing the baby and was following them. He killed his wife, he killed her father, and he, I can't even believe this is 
Okay. Happening. And did this happen in Nightdale? Uh, no. The, 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 his wife and father are in New York. Police say they were at a stop sign in nearby New Milford when Plato opened fire with an assault rifle. The father that raised her, the adoptive father, she had came up here staying with her, him in Wingdale, and next thing you know, there's a shooting. Plato called his mother to confess everything, then he drove back to Wingdale, New York. Responding officers uh, on scene uh, were able to determine that the suspect in this case had died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So I know this case is confusing. To sum it up, Stephen Plato married his daughter. When she wanted to break up, he killed their baby in North Carolina, then drove to New Milford, Connecticut, and killed her and her adoptive father, and then he killed himself. All that, according to police and Stephen's mother's call to 911 that you just heard there. Live in News 8 Control, I'm Kent Pierce, News 8. Some flowers in front of this scene were police here in Nightdale were first called on Earlston Court around 9 a.m. for a welfare check. When they got here, they discovered the body of seven-month-old Bennett Plato. Now, up in New Milford, Connecticut, police there working a double shooting. The two victims in that case, 20-year-old Katie Plato and her adopted father, 56-year-old Anthony Busco, both dead. And a short while later, just across the state border into New York, state troopers found the body of 45-year-old Stephen Plato. Authorities believe he committed suicide. Now, it was Grace Plato, the mother of Stephen, who called police yesterday morning with concerns about her grandson, seven-month-old Bennett. Police have released a redacted version of that 911 call. Here is a short clip of Grace Plato speaking with the dispatch. My son just called me, and uh, he told me he... Oh, my God. In North Carolina, uh, he killed his, his baby, and he's in the house. Nightdale Police Chief Lawrence Cap said it is believed Stephen Plato was in this area as recently as yesterday. Chief Capps would not disclose an approximate time or manner of death for Bennett. The incest charges involving Stephen and Katie are from January, stemming from Virginia. The pair was arrested here in Wake County now this afternoon. Investigators in those states trying to piece together a timeline of what happened, when, and what led to these events. We will have reports coming up at 4, 5, and 6, and of course, keeping you updated on ABC11.com. In just two days, Stephen had wrought immeasurable devastation, fueled by his twisted obsessions. This complex tragedy defies simple explanation. It reveals colossal failures to protect Katie at multiple critical junctures. As an infant, as a teen finding her biological family, and as a young woman falling victim to incest, she was failed repeatedly. Alyssa must now agonizingly mourn the loss of the very child she gave up to save. She questions if warnings about Stephen might have protected Katie from his manipulation. Katie's adoptive parents also missed chances to intervene as she grew dangerously close to her biological father. And when laws were broken, the justice system did not take adequate measures to monitor and separate Stephen and Katie. Could this tragedy have been prevented if the threats were recognized sooner? Might Katie have been sheltered from her father if Alyssa's warnings were heeded? If Katie's adoptive parents had been less acquiescing and willing to set firmer boundaries, could they have protected her from the fatal attraction? We may never find satisfactory answers, but cases like these serve as tough reminders that darkness can fester anywhere, even within families. Predators like Stephen know how to groom the vulnerable, and once in motion, the consequences span generations. This story decimated Katie's future in the most heartbreaking way possible, it's a painful reminder that even with the best intent, sometimes evil still prevails. But we must not look away or become desensitized. Only by facing horror can we hope to stop it. FBI and police across the country are searching for two missing children from Rexburg, Idaho. They may be in serious danger. Seven-year-old Joshua Vallow and 17-year-old Tylee Ryan have been missing since September. Their newlywed parents. Well, this is a very complex case. We have the death of Tammy, and then we have the two missing children. I don't, I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. It doesn't make any sense. The weird thing is, there was no warning signs, and hey, there's something going on here. There's nothing. There was a number of issues that just didn't look right. I don't know what happened to those kids. I Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow are newlyweds. Both of them had spouses who suspiciously died within the last few months. Tonight, we spoke to a man who used to be part of the family and has some insight on what might be going on.
The disappearance of two Idaho children captured national headlines in late 2019, sparking a multi-state search for answers. But the truth was more sinister than anyone could have imagined. This is the story of how a web of lies, extreme religious beliefs, and cold-blooded murder led to the deaths of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan at the hands of their own mother, Lori Vallow Daybell. I'm Eagle, and this is True Crime Legacy. Our story begins in the suburbs of Arizona, where Lori Vallow was living with her fourth husband, Charles, and her two children, seven-year-old J.J. and 16-year-old Tylee. By all accounts, Lori was a doting mother and active member of the Mormon Church. She married Charles in 2006, and the family seemed picture-perfect from the outside. But those closest to Lori say her personality suddenly shifted around 2018. She became completely consumed with apocalyptic end-times prophecies. Lori had always been religious, but now she was fixated on the idea that the second coming of Christ was imminent. She started making outlandish claims that she was receiving visions and could communicate with angels and dead relatives. Her loved ones no longer recognized the woman she had become. Lori's third husband, Joseph Ryan, said Lori had always been enthralled by near-death experiences and visions, but this was on another level. Her sister, Summer Shiflett, and friend, April Raymond, would later testify how Lori's interests grew increasingly sinister she became obsessed with Chad Daybell. Help us understand how somebody is just one man and act of faith away from totally changing who they were in the most perverse and wicked way. You know, I'm not sure that I even completely understand what happened or what was necessarily the catalyst. I think it was a combination of things. I think that Lori was kind of, um, at a crossroads in her life for a lot of reasons. I think she was unhappy in her marriage. Um, she had recently become a grandmother um, and she had met Chad Daybell. And I think, you know, and those are just the circumstances that I am privy to. I don't know everything else that had been going on in her life. I think just the combination of all three was extremely toxic and uh, led us to where we are today. What did you see? that let you know, not that, oh, she's gonna hurt her kids, but this is no longer who I remember. Right, so we had we had not seen each other for, for quite some time. She had lived in Kauai and she'd moved back to Arizona with Charles. And she, uh, initially in 2018, she came for a visit with Tylee. And that's when I started to see the change in her. She was having some different beliefs. Um, that's where she shared with me that she'd had an experience in the temple where she had seen the angel Moroni. Uh, in that she was part of the 144,000. And then it was in a, a, a separate visit in 2019, again with Tylee in tow, an unannounced visit at that, where she kind of applied the pressure a little bit more um, and was really a lot more ag aggressive with her beliefs and um, trying to persuade me. Um, and it just it just wasn't something that made any sense to me. Uh, she looked different. She was speaking differently. She was associating with people that she'd never really been associating with before. And it just, it wasn't the same person that I had known. The person you saw in the courtroom, any trace of the Lori Vallow you knew? No, and I had a lot of trepidation going into uh, my testimony as anticipating what it would feel like to see her and, and be, you know, 20 feet away from her. And I, you know, when I sat down, I looked over at her with her counsel at their table, and it wasn't the person that I, I knew. I, I, I grieved my, the loss of my friend quite a while ago, and it was confirmed that day in court. It, it was a complete stranger I was looking at. It wasn't her. A local author who claimed to receive communications from beyond the grave. Lori started following Chad's teachings about evil spirits and dimensional portals. Chad ran a small publishing company catering to Latter-day Saints interested in end times theology. With titles like Days of Fury and Evading Babylon, Chad's books told sensational stories of his supposed visions of the apocalypse. He founded a website called LDS Avow, preparing a people to share his fringe religious principles and attract a following. Chad preached that there were three levels of heavenly kingdoms, and a person's eternal resting place was determined by the level of their soul. He claimed he could discern whether a person's spirit was light or dark. 
Chad taught that the biblical last days were upon them, so zombies possessed by evil spirits would need to be purged before the second coming. Lori immersed herself in Chad's teachings. She started introducing herself as Lori Maroney, claiming she was married to the angel Maroney in a prior life. Friends like April Raymond were stunned and concerned by Lori's increasingly worrisome behavior. She had always been eccentric, but now she was completely obsessed with Chad's spiritual visions. Charles Vallow also saw these alarming changes unfolding in his wife. According to court documents, Lori had told Charles that she was a translated being sent to lead the 144,000 chosen ones through the apocalypse. She said she could not be killed and threatened Charles with murder if he betrayed her sacred mission. In February 2019, an anxious Charles filed for divorce from Lori in Arizona court. He described her bizarre spiritual claims, like being eternally married to the ancient book of Mormon prophet Moroni. Charles wanted sole custody of seven-year-old JJ, saying Lori had recently become preoccupied with near-death experiences. He seemed to sense the danger coming. Tragically, Charles's worst fears were realized. In July 2019, Lori's brother Alex Cox shot and killed Charles during an altercation at Lori's home in Chandler, Arizona. Where's the bedrooms? Okay, so you, you hear the argument, you step out, what's the first thing that you see? Uh, Charles chasing after Lori Nealon. Okay. Had, had Tyler already gotten the, the bat? No. Did he already have the no. bat? Okay. No. So Charles is coming towards Lori. He's coming, coming towards Lori, and I shoved him back. Okay. And I said, what are you doing? Because he's coming at her aggressively. Okay. And he's a big dude, so I wasn't going to... He's not going to hurt my sister. Okay. So he's coming at her. Yeah. Um, and you, you shoved him back. Yeah. What happened right after that? Uh, he, and this in the... Oh, I'm sorry to he, interrupt you. He got back up and he comes right to me, doesn't look at me, and s continues to yell at Lori. Okay. So he's maybe this far away. Are you in the hallway of the house? or uh, Right close to the doorway the, of, the, of that bedroom. Of the bedroom you were staying? Yes. Okay. So and, you're right near the bedroom? Yes. Okay. So then, um, I don't remember why, he backed up. And then my sister came around behind me, and they ended up in the living room. And then while they're on the way to the living room, Tylee comes out of her bedroom, which is adjacent to the one I was staying in. Okay. With her bed. Okay. Yelling at Charles. Actually, she was behind Charles at first, and then she cut around in front of him in the living room. Okay. So he then went back, they went back towards the living room? Okay. So at, a, at some point in time, Charles backs up. Lori comes out, and they both go around you and towards the living room. Yes. Tylee comes out of her room with a bat. Yep. Um, and basically, they've made their way into the living room. Yes. So Tylee pokes her dad in the bat. In the front. In the, the chest. Front. Okay, so she, or she's yeah. come around this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so she's so, come around. So this is Tylee, and that's Charles. Too. Okay, so she pokes him in the in the bat, yep. or in the chest with the bat. Yeah. You know how many times about? Or Just once, and then she grabs the bat. So he grabs the bat and takes it away. You come towards him. Yeah. Um, and then what happened right after that? He shoved me and spun me around. Okay. And then cracked yeah. me in the back of the head. Cracked you in the back of the head. He yeah. hit you one time? Yeah. Okay. So you go back to your room. I stumbled for yeah, and then I went back in there. Did you fall to the ground when you, when you got hit with the bat? No, I just, my head bounced. Okay. So you go back to your room. Yeah. Get the gun. Yeah. Come back to the living room. Yeah. Now, Tylee and Lauren, Lori are gone. Yeah. And it's just me, and Charles, and Lemire. Okay. And Charles, wh what's he doing again? He's got the bat. Okay. And he's uh, and he's looking at me, and he's going. Whoa. And I told him, I said, Charles, put that bat down. And he goes, What are you going to do about it? How are you holding the gun when that happened? <laughs> oh, okay. Right so you pointed it at yeah. him. Yeah. You tell him, Charles, put the gun down, yeah. or put, put the, the bat, bat down. down. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? He's like, What are you going to do about it? Okay. And then comes at me. Okay, and then you fire a couple times, yeah. um, but you're not sure how many. You know it was more than one. I'm pretty sure it was two. Two, okay, two shots. Where were you aiming on his body? Just center. Okay, so you're pretty sure two shots, center mass. Yeah. He falls to the ground. You don't see Lori or Tylee anymore. Correct. You go to the kitchen, grab a rag for your head. Yeah, tore off some paper towels and wash my hands off. And then go back to your room, put the gun down, yeah. grab your phone, yeah. come back to the kitchen and call in. Yeah. Okay. And then they walked me through and tried to do um, CPR. Okay. Cox claimed self-defense, but many family members suspected Lori was behind the attack on her ex-husband. 
Charles had desperately tried to get help, only to be slain before anyone could intervene. Now with Charles out of the picture, Lori's path of destruction quickly escalated. She drained JJ's dollar four, zero, zero, zero a month trust fund and fled to Rexburg, Idaho with her two kids. Lori's niece, Melanie Pulowski, later told the FBI how Lori's paranoia increased exponentially during this time. She ranted about how people were after her and asked Melanie to lie to police on her behalf. In Rexburg, Lori reconnected with Chad Daybell. The two had met previously at an LDS preppers conference where Chad was speaking. Now they started exchanging emails about their shared spiritual interests. Chad encouraged Lori's bizarre beliefs that she was immortal, assigned to usher in the last days. Soon, their relationship turned romantic. Chad's wife, Tammy Daybell, noticed her husband growing more distant. In a Facebook message to a friend, Tammy confessed she felt betrayed by Chad's emotional affair with Lori. Just two weeks after Tammy's death in October 2019, Chad and Lori married in a quickie ceremony in Kauai. Around this time, JJ's grandparents, Larry and Kay Woodcock, grew worried they hadn't heard from the boy. In late November 2019, they requested police do a welfare check at Lori's home in Rexburg, but JJ and Tylee were nowhere to be found. Lori claimed JJ was visiting relatives in Arizona, which police quickly discovered was a lie. Lori maintained the kids were safe and she had done nothing wrong. She and Chad fled to Hawaii as police ramped up the search. Investigators realized something was very suspicious about Tammy Daybell's sudden death. They also started dismantling Lori and Chad's web of deception and secrecy. Police uncovered evidence that Lori had been lying about her children's whereabouts for months. She told witnesses Tylee was attending classes at BYU-Idaho, but there was no record of her enrollment. When officers searched Lori's home, the children's belongings were still there, including JJ's service dog. Darker discoveries put Lori's motives under the microscope. Police obtained emails between Lori and Chad, where she asked him to assess her children's spirits. Chad deemed Tylee a 4.1 dark spirit, who had turned against the light in previous lives. This suggested Lori saw her daughter as one of the zombies who Chad said must be purged. One of Lori's friends, Melanie Gibbs, told police about Lori's chilling claims that Tylee had become a zombie, so she had no choice but to kill her. Lori allegedly said JJ had outlived his usefulness, so she and Chad had buried him in Chad's pet cemetery. But police could find no trace of the children's remains there. In June 2020, investigators finally found the missing pieces to the puzzle. This morning, a potentially devastating end to the search for Idaho siblings Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Family members telling ABC News that two sets of human remains were found on Chad Daybell's property Tuesday, along to his wife Lori Vallow's missing children. The family saying in a statement, we are filled with unfathomable sadness that these two bright stars were stolen from us and only hope that they died without pain or suffering. Police have not yet publicly confirmed the identities of the remains. Dale is to assure that he's not a flight risk. Mr. Daybell, do you understand the allegations on both counts that have been brought against you? I do. Daybell has been charged with two counts of destruction, alteration, or concealment of evidence. The judge setting his bail at $1 million after prosecutors argued the manner in which one of the bodies was concealed was, quote, particularly egregious. It's not they uncovered two dismembered bodies buried in Chad's backyard, Tylee and JJ. Autopsies determined both children had been murdered months earlier. Still, Lori and Chad pled not guilty to all charges against them. The trial in 2023 painted a disturbing portrait of two fanatics whose doomsday religion led them to unspeakable acts. Prosecutors built a methodical case that religious delusions were the central motive behind the cruel murders of Charles, JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. The state's argument was simple. Lori and Chad's obsession with end times visions made them view their family as possessed agents of Satan. In their minds, killing the zombies was completely justified, even righteous. Prosecutors pointed to the email where Chad labeled Tylee an evil spirit as proof the couple saw the teen as beyond saving. Jurors heard excruciating evidence about the condition of the children's bodies. JJ had been bound with duct tape and suffocated in plastic bags. 
Tylee's body was so damaged and burned, investigators could not determine how she was killed. Experts theorized Lori's brother Alex Cox was enlisted to carry out the actual murder of the kids. Perhaps most shocking was the revelation that JJ's grandparents were just minutes away from potentially rescuing him on the day he likely died. Cell phone data showed Alex Cox was at Chad's property, while the Woodcocks tried to visit JJ next door. Instead, Cox texted that JJ was asleep, forever silencing the child. The prosecution argued Chad and Lori carefully planned the murders to collect insurance money from Tammy and Charles's deaths. Tammy's body was exhumed and found to contain deadly levels of medication. Saying that's what this case is all about, they painted the picture that defendant Lori Vallow Daybell conspired with her latest husband Chad Daybell and brother Alex Cox to kill her own kids and Chad's first wife Tammy Daybell. We learned in court today that Tammy died by asphyxiation just a few weeks before Chad married Lori at the end of 2019. Prosecutors laid out a timeline showing Lori and Chad married immediately after eliminating spouses they saw as obstacles. The mystery surrounding the kids' disappearance started long before Lori and Chad were found in Hawaii. Lori married Chad in Hawaii on November 5th. He's her fifth husband. But before that, she was married to Charles Vallow, and they lived in Arizona. In January of 2019, body camera footage from Arizona police shows Charles pleading to officers for Lori to get help and claiming she was trying to kill him. You're murder today or tomorrow? But officers determined she was fine. About five months later, on July 11th, Lori's brother, Alex Cox, shot and killed Charles in what Alex claimed was self-defense. Body camera footage shows police responding to the home. And is he hurt or is he alive? Or? Yeah, there's blood. He's, he's not moving. Lori showed up a short time later. How long have you lived here? Like three weeks. Oh, geez. Yeah, okay. That's why the neighbor stood on us. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, hi, neighbor, sorry. The very next month, Lori, Tylee, JJ, Alex, and Lori's niece, Melanie, moved to Rexburg. September 8th, 2019, the last time 17-year-old Tylee Ryan is seen. She was on a trip to Yellowstone with her mother, Lori Vallow, and uncle, Alex Cox. A cellular analysis survey team, or CAST, with the FBI analyzed data from Alex's phone. According to the probable cause affidavit, the GPS data points used by CAST are highly accurate, placing a device within six meters of its location. On September 9th, one day after the Yellowstone trip, that GPS data puts Alex's phone at Lori's Rexburg apartment between 2.42 a.m. and 3.37 a.m. This is the only time he was at Lori's between midnight and 6 a.m., according to the PCA. A few hours later, 9.21 a.m. until a little after 11 a.m., Alex's phone pings at Chad Daybell's property, specifically placing him behind the home near the barn. Just 14 minutes after Alex leaves, Chad sends a text to his then wife, Tammy Daybell. The text reads, quote, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun and he was still walking along. I got close enough, one shot did the trick. He's now in our pet cemetery, fun times. Police state this was suspicious because raccoons are nocturnal. Neighbors of Chad's also reported to police frequent bonfires at Chad's house, which was out of the norm. Fast forward a few weeks to September 22nd, the last time JJ Vallow was seen. Police interviewed Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend David Warwick, who were visiting Lori that weekend. They told police Lori said JJ had turned into a zombie. The next morning, September 23rd, between 8 and 9 a.m., Warwick didn't see JJ and asked where he was. Lori stated he was acting out, so, quote, Alex had come and taken JJ. GPS data once again puts Alex on Chad's property that day from 9.55 a.m. until 10.12 a.m., peeing near the pond. At the time, Chad was married to Tammy, and they also lived in Rexburg. By this point, Chad and Lori were believed to have some type of relationship. Court documents show they met in 2018 at a religious conference in Utah. Then, on October 19th of 2019, Tammy Daybell died in her sleep. Court records show 10 days before her death, 
Tammy called 911 and reported a masked man shot at her in her driveway. Court documents later indicate Lori's brother tried to shoot and kill Tammy. Initially, a coroner ruled Tammy died of natural causes, but investigators later reopened the case and exhumed her body on December 11th. One day later, Lori's brother Alex died suddenly of natural causes. Two weeks later, Lori and Chad got married in Hawaii. Then four months later, in February of 2021. The County Sheriff's Office has received the autopsy report on Tammy Daybell's body from the Utah Medical Examiner, but they are not releasing it to the public just yet. That report has still not been released, but Lori and Chad are charged in connection with conspiring to kill Tammy. On November 26th, one month after Tammy's death, Kay and Larry Woodcock, JJ's grandparents, ordered a welfare check for JJ. Police say Lori told them JJ was with her friend Melanie Gibb in Arizona. Melanie told East Idaho News Chad called her that day and said when police call, don't pick up the phone. He says, yeah, the police are over at Lori's house checking on JJ. And I'm like, JJ's not with Kay? <laughs> No, my heart dropped deeper. Rexburg police returned to Lori's home the next day, this time with a search warrant, but Lori was gone. That's when Chad and Lori, newly married, are found in Hawaii. Police in Hawaii served a court order saying Lori had five days to physically produce the kids. The newlyweds ignored that deadline. She's got an, an end game in her head, and although it, this is not a game, but Obviously, she thinks it is for you to shun an order from a court telling you what you need to do. Police arrested Lori in Hawaii on February 20th, 2020. She was charged with child desertion, obstructing an officer, contempt of court, and solicitation to commit a crime. Do you know that you have been charged uh, in the state of Idaho? Uh, with a number of charges. At this point, both her kids are still missing. Lori was extradited from Hawaii to Idaho on March 5th. KTVB was the only media outlet to get video of Lori landing at the Boise Airport. From there, she was flown to Rexburg. Welcome back, Lori. Where are your kids? KTVB was there as she made her first court appearance in Idaho on March 6th. All right. Her son, Colby Ryan, was also there, along with Kay and Larry Woodcock. Where are Tyler and JJ? Where are the kids? Where are the kids? Fast forward to June of 2020, nine months after JJ and Tylee disappeared. Investigators searched Chad Daybell's Idaho property and found human remains. That's when police arrested him. The uh, investigators and detectives have recovered uh, what's believed to be human remains that are uh, not identified at this time. Rexburg police later confirmed the remains belonged to JJ and Tylee. I just want you to know I came here for one thing. That's, that's the C world. Then in May of 2021. A Fremont County grand jury indicted the couple on two charges of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder. And another first in this case, with Daybell charged with first-degree murder of his late wife, Tammy Daybell. Mem to drive home Lori's state of mind, prosecutors used her own words against her. Jurors heard clips of Lori's podcast interview where she spoke of people turning into zombies. They also heard recordings of her rattling on about spiritual visions to her friend Melanie Gibbs. These recordings established that Lori fervently believed in Chad's teachings. The defense tried to counter by arguing Lori was severely mentally ill. Her attorney said she was manipulated into adopting Chad's bizarre beliefs when she was in a vulnerable state. They claimed Charles's shooting by Alex Cox, who had a history of violence, sent her into a downward spiral of paranoia. But the jury did not buy Lori was merely a pawn controlled by others. After all, she was the one who expressionlessly lied to police about her missing children's whereabouts time and again. For nearly a year, not a shred of guilt or remorse crossed Lori's face while her children's bodies were secretly buried. Her act may have convinced her followers, but the jury saw right through it. In May 2022, after just two hours of deliberation, 
Lori Vallow Daybell was found guilty on all counts, two charges of first-degree murder for killing her children, and one charge of conspiracy to murder Chad's wife, Tammy. A jury in Idaho has found a mother guilty of killing her own children and her husband's first wife. As Chris Van Cleve reports, witnesses testified the so-called doomsday mom believed her kids were possessed by evil spirits. Guilty. It took less than seven hours for the jury to find Lori Vallow Daybell guilty on all charges, including first-degree murder of her two youngest children and conspiracy in the death of her husband Chad's then-wife Tammy. My heart hurts for these three. Family members were emotional after the verdict. JJ, Papa misses you. I miss you. The verdict marked the culmination of an investigation that had captivated and horrified the nation. At her sentencing hearing in June, Lori continued trying to beatify her image against all evidence to the contrary. Her strange jailhouse statements about communicating with angels and zombies revealed she was still deeply enveloped in Chad's teachings. The judge was unmoved, sentencing Lori to life behind bars without chance of parole. So in the end, how did a seemingly normal mother turn into a callous murderer of children? The full tragic tale reveals she was on a dark path long before meeting Chad Daybell. Looking back, many noticed oddities in Lori even during her early adulthood. Despite having no formal jobs, she always seemed to live lavishly. Former friend April Raymond recalled Lori's manipulation tactics, like dramatizing minor illnesses to gain sympathy. She horizontalized relationships, turning people against each other. April often caught Lori in small lies designed to twist truths and deceive. After Lori's third divorce from Joseph Ryan, things took a troubling turn. Joseph actually feared Lori would kill him and avoided being alone with her. He secretly recorded her making threats against his life. His concerns proved well-founded when Lori targeted him next, after Charles. Charles Vallow sought help from Lori's family but they failed to intervene before it was too late. He accurately identified how Lori's religious delusions had turned downright dangerous. But sadly, Charles was portrayed as the problem rather than Lori. Her brother Alex enabled her darkest tendencies when he shot Charles at her home. With each successive husband, Lori appears to have devolved further into her cold, cunning, and cruel persona. Friends noticed how she constantly projected blame outward justifying even her most appalling behavior. She driven by a frightening mix of greed, bloodlust, and desire for control. Lori's fifth and final husband, Chad Daybell, encouraged these sinister traits to fully blossom. Chad preyed on vulnerable people interested in his unorthodox teachings. Lori made the perfect recruit, as she had long gravitated toward the magical thinking and grandeur that Chad promised. In Chad's world, Lori could view herself as all-powerful. Ultimately, the married couple's shared apocalyptic delusions created an echo chamber that drowned out reality. In their minds, they were the righteous chosen ones ordained to judge humanity as evil or good. Lori's children and Chad's wife posed threats that had to be neutralized. This case illustrates the immense danger when two people reinforce each other's deepest paranoid fantasies. Lori and Chad's beliefs fostered an us-versus-them environment, where compassion disappears. Killing was not only justified, it was necessary to serve their so-called higher purpose. The tragic murders of JJ, Tylee, Charles, and Tammy Daybell represent the costs when extremes go unchecked. Those closest to Lori Vallow saw red flags long before she turned violent. This case highlights the need for intervention when religious beliefs turn toward harm. Perhaps if Lori's family had forced psychiatric intervention back in 2018, four innocent lives could have been spared. But the true crime legacy of this case remains one of preventable loss. Charles Vallow was the lone voice of reason crying for help, only to be silenced by the system that should have protected him. In the end, J.J. and Tylee were victims not only of their mother's cruelty, but of the society that dismissed the threat until it was too late. The little boy who loved dinosaurs and his devoted big sister will be remembered for the joy they brought to so many. Their lives enrich our world more than their deaths could ever diminish it. For those who loved them, the light of J.J. and Tylee will shine on eternally. 
For Missing Colorado Teenager Dylan Redwine continues, and with this cold weather passing through the area, the latest concern, if Dylan is still out there, can he survive? Since a Colorado teen disappeared during a court-ordered visit with his father, and today the search for Dylan Redwine intensified in La Plata County. His life my life, and he, he meant everything to me. And I... 2013, they finally found his remains, not far from his dad's home. Investigators have been trying to crack the case ever since. Welcome back, true crime fans. Today, we're investigating the disturbing murder of 13-year-old Dylan Redwine. This tragic case has all the makings of a twisted thriller. A missing child, a dad with a horrific secret, ominous evidence, and a community left searching for answers. Dylan was, by all accounts, a normal, fun-loving boy. He loved the great outdoors and playing sports with friends. But in 2012, his whole life was turned upside down following a court-ordered visit with his estranged father over Thanksgiving. What was supposed to be a holiday celebration ended with Dylan missing and his father spinning lies. Within months, some of Dylan's remains were found just miles from his dad's home. And two years later, the discovery of his skull revealed the horrifying truth. Dylan was murdered at the hands of the person he should have been able to trust most. Today, we'll explore what led to this unthinkable act by a failed father. The warning signs were missed along the way, but the revealing evidence ultimately exposed him as a liar and a killer. To start unpacking this tragic crime, let's set the stage by meeting Dylan and his deeply divided family. Dylan grew up in the picturesque mountains of southwest Colorado with his mom Elaine, his dad Mark, and his older brother Corey. The Redwines made their home in a rural town called Bayfield, surrounded by forests, rivers, and wildlife. But things took a turn when Elaine and Mark divorced in 2007 after 18 years of marriage. Elaine was granted full custody of both boys. Mark was allowed visitation, but he distanced himself over the years. Mark worked constantly as a truck driver, often out on long hauls. He was only in town about 90 days out of the whole year. Mark rarely took advantage of opportunities to visit his sons when he was around. In 2012, Elaine moved five hours away to Colorado Springs and brought 13-year-old Dylan with her. Older brother Corey stayed back temporarily, but soon joined them. This put Dylan even farther from his dad. Former therapist Linda Stanley testified Dylan saw his dad as untrustworthy and felt unsafe with him. Mark had said cruel things about Elaine that offended Dylan's fierce loyalty to his family. Despite their fractured relationship, a court demanded Dylan visit Mark over Thanksgiving break in 2012. On November 18th, Elaine reluctantly put her son on a plane to see his father. It was the last time she'd ever see Dylan alive. Dylan landed in Durango, Colorado, about 30 minutes from Mark's home. Chilling surveillance footage showed little interaction between sullen father and son. At Mark's house that night, Dylan texted a friend asking to leave because he felt so uncomfortable. But Mark said no. Around 10 p.m., Dylan suddenly stopped responding to texts. According to Mark, after dinner, they watched a movie before he went to bed around 10 p.m. But the next morning, Mark says he couldn't wake Dylan up on the couch. So Mark left alone around 7.30 a.m. and went to his office. Big red flag number one. What kind of dad leaves his sleeping 13-year-old at home alone without making sure he's okay? Especially a kid he rarely sees and has a strained relationship with? When Mark returned around 11.30 a.m., Dylan had vanished. Mark casually texted Elaine asking if she knew where Dylan was, but as a panicked parent, she immediately suspected her ex had done something to their son. Over the next few days, Mark sent Elaine bizarrely relaxed messages about Dylan's continued absence. He pretended to search around town for the missing boy. But according to first responders, Mark never actually bothered to help Cruz combing the wilderness for his son. Red flag number two. I think Mark has something to do with it. I think he's either got him hidden out or, you know, done something. And 
disposed, I, I think, I strongly think that he's involved. Why? He hasn't done a single thing since Dylan has been gone. Why do you say that? What has he not done? Um, he hasn't been to any of the benefits. He wasn't there for Dylan's birthday vigil. He hasn't um, helped at all with the Find Missing Dylan Redwine Fund. Um, Dr. Phil, I'd like to make a comment about the fundraiser thing. I have several people in the community in which I live that are reaching out to me on a daily basis, can volunteer in their time to have some involvement with a fundraiser. But somebody from this side of the room called her and told her that they didn't want her to have any involvement in anything that had anything to do with raising money and didn't want me involved in any of that. You're wrong, and you know you're wrong. If you his total apathy that his son was missing. Most parents would be frantic. Within a week, the local sheriff's office was unsettled by Mark's statements and called the FBI for help. Agent John Grusing met with Mark several times, looking for holes in his story. Mark's timeline kept shifting. He couldn't provide any of Dylan's belongings for search dogs because supposedly nothing of Dylan's was in his home. Big red flag number three. How do you not have a single thing of your own son's at your house? The day the search for Dylan Redwine intensified in La Plata County. Action 7 News was the only in this county. From Sky 7, you see those hundreds of people gathered together, optimistic, to finally bring Dylan home. So hopefully we can find some evidence or clues. Clues like Dylan's backpack, cell phone, or some clothes. Some believe he may have thrown something out of a car window or... Meanwhile, Elaine and Corey were panicked as they drove between Colorado Springs and Bayfield, joining search parties. They insisted Dylan would never run away without telling them. In late November, cadaver dogs detected Dylan's scent at a tranquil lake nearby but approaching winter weather stalled searching efforts. Mountain roads like Middle Mountain were too treacherous for crews with heavy snowfall. In April 2013, the snow finally melted enough for law enforcement to canvas those remote areas. Elaine's husband, Mike Hall, took it upon himself to monitor Middle Mountain Road after seeing Mark speeding around the closure. Then that June, Dylan's partial remains were tragically discovered in the Middle Mountain Woods, just miles from Mark's home. A homicide investigation after his remains were found today. Action 7 reporter Melissa Colorado spoke to Dylan Redwine's father. She has more from Durango. Doug and Shelley, I'm standing right near Mark Redwine's house near Viacito Lake. The father of Dylan Redwine is visibly shaken up. He did not want to go on camera, but he still was able to talk to us. Take a listen. They got 2% of his remains. That means 98% of them is still scattered out there in the tree somewhere. They said two femurs, a shoulder blade, bone, or something to do with the shoulder. So what happened to Dylan? With the recovery of his body, that makes it, from our perspective, a homicide. Investigators believe Dylan Redwine was possibly kidnapped and killed. We asked Mark Redwine how he felt about Dylan's death now becoming a homicide investigation. Mark Redwine said this. They can have a homicide all they want to, but if they feel like I've had any involvement with it, then why am I standing on my front porch having this conversation with you? At the time, the coroner could not determine cause of death with so little recovered initially. But the finding of Dylan's blood in multiple areas of Mark's living room suggested he'd been killed inside the house before his body was dumped. Mark tried claiming the blood was from a minor injury long ago, but testing showed it had seeped under the replaced carpets and furniture. Big red flag number four. Someone clearly tried to clean up the blood and stage the scene. In August 2015, Hikers found Dylan's skull off trail uphill from the original remains. His skull showed clear signs of blunt force trauma and knife wounds, obvious markers of murder. Authorities started re-examining the case with homicide now confirmed. Let's discuss what investigators believe happened and how they zeroed in on pinning Mark as the prime suspect. Investigators suspected was that Mark Redwine knows something about what happened to his son Dylan. Klismet couldn't get into specifics because it's still an open investigation, but he says he has decades of experience and he is never wrong. 
For now, Mark is a person of interest. Investigators say that's because of inconsistencies in his statements and his behavior throughout this case. Klisman says the next step is to find probable cause, more facts and evidence to arrest Mark. Him, and he needs to be aware of that. Mark couldn't be reached for comment, but he's always claimed he's innocent. Meanwhile, the community that watched Dylan grow up and grew to love him waits for the next step in this case. We're approaching three years since Dylan disappeared. Well, the sheriff's office is still asking that anyone who might know anything that could help in their investigation of Dylan's disappearance or death to call their hotline. That number, 970-382-7511. You can hear. With Dylan's traumatic cause of death established, authorities went back to build a timeline of evidence pointing to who was responsible. The blood traces inside Mark's home combined with the fatal wounds to Dylan's skull indicated he was likely killed within the house. This explains why Mark creepily couldn't wake Dylan up that next morning. Dylan was already dead. When cadaver dogs searched the home in 2013, they alerted to the scent of human remains in Mark's truck bed, on his clothes, and outside the house. It seemed probable Mark had used his truck to dispose of Dylan's body. Importantly, the dogs did not pick up any scent of remains upstairs. This contrasted Mark's claim that Dylan bled downstairs from a supposed bloody nose incident upstairs. Nice try, Mark, but the forensic evidence doesn't lie. Dylan's half-brother Brandon also disclosed a very telling conversation. While searching for Dylan, Mark became fixated on the term blunt force trauma before Dylan's skull and cause of death was ever known. Brandon felt Mark was letting clues about his guilt slip unconsciously by continually repeating blunt force trauma. Mark clearly knew more than he let on, a wildlife expert further demolished Mark's lies that wild animals killed Dylan. She testified bears were hibernating when Dylan went missing. Also, scavengers don't carry remains long distances uphill like Dylan's skull was found. Prosecutors believe Mark wanted search teams wasting time around the lake miles from his home. But he knew once winter passed, Dylan's remains would be found off Middle Mountain Road, where a neighbor spotted Mark. Mark's general behavior was also incriminating. First responders noted his casual drinking and lack of interest in searching for his son. Close family friends said Mark never displayed the expected grief and anguish of a parent who just lost their child. Mark's sloppy lies and changing story in FBI interviews only made him seem more suspicious. Why? You know, it's just comforting to know that McCly County has named him um, the person of interest. Dylan's mother, Elaine Hall, has always had suspicions about whether her ex-husband played a role in her son's death. She's even sued him over it and says Mark needs to cooperate. If he has nothing to hide, then call the investigators and, you know, do as they ask so he can clear his name in this. He also took an unusual interest when Agent Grusing suggested a bear attack theory. It seemed Mark jumped on the idea because it shifted blame away from himself. Ultimately, the physical evidence and eyewitness accounts painted a clear picture. Mark Redwine had murdered his son and tried to cover up the horrific crime. But what could drive a father to commit such an unthinkable act against his own child? In 2011, Dylan made a disturbing discovery on his dad's computer that decimated the image he had of his father. Mark had taken degrading photos of himself wearing women's lingerie and a feces-filled diaper. Dylan was traumatized and confided in his brother, Corey. With Dylan's half-brother, Corey, he's making some disturbing claims. He says he has seen compromising photos that Dylan had of his father cross-dressing, even eating his own feces. Mark Redwine could spend the rest of his life in prison if convicted of Dylan's murder. At just 12 years old, Dylan's whole identity was shaken. He could no longer see his dad as a role model. Forensic psychologist Dr. Sylvia Gehringer explained that children idolize their same-sex parent at that age. Finding Mark's sick photos would have crushed Dylan's self-esteem during critical development. Dr. Gehringer said the traumatic revelation cost Dylan all respect for his father. 
This caused a tremendous rift in their relationship at a vulnerable time. Mark had been Dylan's primary father figure with Elaine working. But the disturbing pictures made it impossible for Dylan to continue viewing Mark as someone to look up to. In August 2012, during a trip alone together, Mark complained about Dylan's mom and criticized his brother's behavior. Dylan staunchly defended Elaine and Corey. He texted Corey repeatedly, asking for the embarrassing photos of their dad. Dylan clearly hoped to confront Mark about the pictures on this trip. But Corey refused, afraid of escalating the family crisis. Dr. Geeringer believes that by Thanksgiving 2012, Dylan felt ready to expose his dad's hypocrisy. She explained that young teens crave proving their independence and moral high ground. Confronted with the shameful truth, Mark likely attacked his son in a blind rage. His attempts to cover up the blood shows he knew Dylan was dead right away. With search efforts focused elsewhere, Mark exploited the rugged landscape to stash Dylan's remains. This is speculative, but fits the known evidence. Dylan ultimately died trying to hold his dad accountable, only to be betrayed by the one person who should have protected him. For years after Dylan's death, his killer father, Mark Redwine, eluded arrest as authorities built their case. But those who loved Dylan never stopped fighting for justice. His courageous mother, Elaine, and loyal brother, Corey, endlessly advocated to solve Dylan's case. They knew Mark was responsible, even when limitations in evidence initially prevented prosecution. The community rallied around, bringing answers to light. In 2015, over 500 people joined a walk for Dylan, marching where his remains were found on Middle Mountain Road. Corey said, we're here for justice and closure. The event showed Dylan was not forgotten. Around this time, Elaine collaborated with another grieving mother to lobby Colorado lawmakers. They successfully pushed for harsher punishment for tampering with human remains. Dylan's senseless death highlighted the need for tougher laws against desecrating the dead. In 2016, Elaine and Corey publicly declared on Dr. Phil they believed Mark murdered Dylan. As public suspicion increasingly surrounded him, a legal breakthrough finally came in 2017. For joining us tonight on Denver 7 at 5, I'm Jackie Crea. In less than 24 hours, a Colorado father accused of killing his teenage son will stand before a judge. Law enforcement in the state of Washington arrested Mark Redwine yesterday. It came hours after a grand jury indicted him on murder charges for killing his son. Denver 7 legal analyst Dan Reck reviewed the grand jury indictment released after Redwine's arrest. What is the most damning evidence that the prosecution has right now? The most harmful evidence to Mark Redwine is that Dylan's blood is found in many places in Mark's house and in his truck. A grand jury indicted Mark Redwine on charges of second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death. He would face trial for Dylan's killing after five long years of freedom. The trial endured delays, but finally commenced in 2021. Over two excruciating weeks, prosecutors methodically laid out the damning evidence exposing Mark as a liar and killer. Some of the most heart-wrenching testimony came from those who cherished Dylan most. Friends shared fond memories of his kind spirit and close family bonds. Losing Dylan left an eternal void in their lives. His brother Corey described the agony of losing his best friend in the world. He longed for justice, but lamented having his own father revealed as the monster responsible. Elaine recalled her final embrace with Dylan before sending him off to his death. She believed Mark became dangerous when questioned or criticized. Tragically, Dylan paid the ultimate price for trying to shine a light on the truth. The defense desperately tried pinning Elaine as the real killer, preposterously claiming she framed Mark. But the jurors saw right through those wild lies. 
After four hours deliberating, they found Mark guilty on both charges. A jury found Mark Redwine guilty of murdering his 13-year-old son Dylan back in 2012. The murder occurring during a court-ordered visit to his father's home outside of Durango. Cardio News Channel 13, Spencer Swisher joins us live from Monument Now. Find the defendant, Mark Redwine, guilty of count number one. As far as Corey Redwine is concerned, it's the last time he's going to be in the same area as his dad again. That'll be the last um, time, you know, I ever see her. He'll be the last day he'll ever be in my life. Instead, he's going to shift his focus to Dylan and not the past nine years. You know, I'll remember Dylan for what he was when he was alive, how bright and how um, powerful he was as a young child. These nine years have been focused on his death, and um, it's a... In July 2022, Mark received a sentence of 48 years in prison. The judge told him, this is about being held accountable for the choice you made to murder your son. After years of anguish, Dylan's brave spirit and his family's relentless efforts were rewarded with some measure of justice. His light continues shining as a lasting reminder that truth and morality will always prevail over lies and depravity even if vindication takes time. While the pain remains, Elaine hopes Dylan's death was not in vain. She said, we have accomplished change that will mean something. The next time a person goes missing, there will be punishment. Out of tragedy, hope persists that society can prevent similar fates for other innocent children. Dylan's enduring legacy is making the world safer from monsters hiding in plain sight. Thank you for joining me to honor his memory on this difficult journey. His bright life cut short cautions us about the darkness, potentially lurking within dysfunctional families. Join me next time as we unravel another complex true crime story. Until then, take care.